Welcome to the Seriously Social Podcast with your host, Simone Douglas. Today's guest is Kimon Lycos from Mile and Lycos. He and Simone chat about storytelling, the business of marketing, and the immersive narrative of his podcast, Forever Has Fallen. Okay, so today I'm joined on the Seriously Social Podcast by Kimon from Mile Lycos. Thank you very much for joining Thanks me. Thanks a lot for having me here. Well, it's um, really nice. These are lovely chairs. They, these are my favorite comfy chairs. Yeah, they're super comfy. Yeah. Um, so I guess... Uh, some people might be wondering um, why I have, you know, one of Adelaide's leading advertising agencies sat in my red chairs, but it's because you've done something super exciting, yeah? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're actually trying to redefine not all of global entertainment. I mean, we'll, we'll be humble, um, but we're introducing a new type of global entertainment. Yeah. Um, because we're kind of like, why has entertainment always, I mean, since the 1890s, uh, entertainment really has been a one-way experience. Yeah. So you sit there, you pay your ticket, you sit there and bang, you're entertained. Mm-hmm. And that's a great model and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, but in this world, this digital age, the social media age, why the hell can't entertainment be a two-way interaction? Why can't you, as a fan, get involved in the story and um, be part of the story and interact with the story? both you know explore the the characters interact with characters explore companies and and events and issues that occur within the story and go deeper so um what we've created is is an immersive experience that's linked to storytelling and it also becomes a game which is just crazy to me but this was an all-consuming idea for you quite some time ago yeah oh it's been yeah three years three years in the making Three years in the making and an interactive story that changes, I think, both the face of entertainment, like you said, and changes the face of marketing to a degree because there are so many opportunities within it as well. But what's been the most um, surprising or exciting part of the journey so far? Well, we've got a little bit um, Awesome Worlds. So if you remember, uh, Awesome Worlds was very famous for creating War of the Worlds and uh, there was... a actually still is the benchmark of audio. I mean, podcasting and so forth is uh, taking off, but Awesome Worlds actually established the benchmark of audio drama back then. Well, he really did, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, you you can't, you literally can't beat that. I I can't imagine you could ever beat that. Um, And and so he basically convinced, you know, America that there was an alien invasion. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, we're kind of a little bit there in terms of the fictional company that we've got um, which is offering digital immortality, people are actually starting to think that it's real because we've got a website for it. Mm-hmm. So the foreversocial.com, uh, you can check out. Um, if you like, you can sign up uh, for digital immortality as we've had about 50 or 55,000 people do so far. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just weird like how something that you've created starts to take on meaning in people's lives and that they're talking and discussing it without you yeah. between themselves. It's, it's an odd feeling. Yeah, so, so the, the product or the game itself is called Forever Is Fallen. Yeah, Forever Has Fallen. Has yep. Fallen, yeah. So um, from an age demographic perspective, how wide is the spread that you've managed to engage in this process at this point? It's, um, so we, we started off on the premise of would, would look at around the 23 to 45 year old mm-hmm. mark. Um, but we're, we've actually gone now, because we've, we've, we've opened it up and we can see that we're engaging, you know, 18, even, <laughs> I actually was engaged with somebody on our Discord community and it turned out that this was a 12 year old kid. And I'm like, <laughs> <No>. okay, <laughs> this is where my life has gone to, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm offering um, customer service to a 12 year old. That, that, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, so I, I would imagine that we're reaching a bit of a younger audience now, I would yeah. say uh, around 16 all the way through to 50 now. Okay. Don't forget 50 year olds, and I'm one of them unfortunately, you know, we're the Donkey Kong generation. Yep. You know, we started off with Nintendos, mm. and you were like, you know, king of the playground, turning up with one of those handheld Nintendo things uh, way back in the day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's gone broader and broader, more broader than what I expected it would. Yeah. Uh, what is like the next big challenge? 
for this interactive experience? Where are you guys up to with all the episodes and things? So we're we're due to launch in uh, a couple of weeks' time, actually. Uh, so we've got an embargo going out soon. We're, we're talking with a uh, with a big media uh, mm-hmm. entertainment media company about an exclusive. Um, so that's yet to be nailed mm. down. That's why I'm a little bit mm, when when it's going to land. Uh, but come hell or high water, we will be launching in uh, within three weeks the next two episodes, yeah. and then it's we've got to start dropping episodes every three three to four weeks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so our next big challenge is uh, to make sure that episode four and five is awesome, mm-hmm. and then keep being awesome, and then um, just growing our audience. Yeah, cool. So. I've discovered the website and I've made it that far, let's just say. So I'm this brand new person that's listening to this podcast as it drops. I've made it to Forever Has Fallen's landing page. What is the beginning of my experience going to look like? Well, first thing is you listen to the uh, the podcast. Um, when we came up with this as a concept, I said straight off the bat to, to my team, we're not doing anything until we come up with an absolute awesome story. Mm-hmm. Um, so. We, and, and we managed to, which was good. Uh, but so Forever Has Fallen does and should stand by itself just purely as a podcast, mm-hmm. a fictional podcast thriller series. Um, now, if you happen to get curious, because in the first episode, for example, you hear a mobile phone number is mentioned. Now, if you get curious and you want to chase that, then you can become a bounty hunter. So you sign up, you become a bounty hunter, and uh, you can chase that clue within the hunter's lair where we've got some communication stuff and yeah, some interactive yeah. stuff. Um, and from there, it's just, I don't know, it's like Alice in Wonderland. You fall mm. down that rabbit hole and there's all sorts of things to discover. Yeah, cool. Well, and I think that it's just, it's such a fantastic concept. And in terms of that immersive experience, so like you said, you can listen to it and, and you within it to a degree, but if you choose to go down the rabbit hole, then you're within a whole nother world, really. Yeah, and, and you'll find, uh, so it's around, it's been really good fun as a storyteller to go from, okay, so here's a 20 minute podcast that we've written, and then, okay, so how do we extend the story and the characters, you know, with email or with a text message or um, with some hidden content, uh, you know, where we've made like little mini film clips and. Yeah. And, and, and that it all still has to hang together. That's been a lot of fun, yeah. um, and it's, but it's been a huge challenge because mm. you've got to remember everything else that you've done to make sure that it all makes sense yeah. and that it all makes one complete picture. Yeah, and it all fits together, absolutely. Um, you touched on the fact as a storyteller, which is obviously you know a huge part of what you do in your day job, um, but what do you think are the modern day challenges for business owners in telling their stories? Because as an advertising agency, you guys help businesses do this all the time. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge is to really take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've become more and more pragmatic. And I'm just shocked at how many companies seem not to be in love with their own brand. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, like they, they, you know, they, they've got a shingle out and they, they've got a logo, um, they've got a name, um, they want to attract customers, but the scant detail that they put into telling their story and about trying to engage their target audience and trying to build a community and trying to really connect on an emotional level. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we deal with, you know, a lot of different, you know, we, we're dealing with everything from um, garden edging products all the way through to you know some of the world's most advanced um, switch gear uh, that goes into mining camps but every, throughout that whole gamut there are customers who need to make a buying decision in consideration against the competitor yeah and it's amazing how many businesses operate almost like within the belief of that they're in this bubble and I'm like you, you are aware that there are competitors. You are aware that there's somebody else trying to convince your customer mm. that they're better than you. Yeah. And yet the effort that you put into convincing, it's almost like going to um, getting going to court. Yeah. And just turning up on the day going, 
ah, look, I'll make it up. You know, I'll convince the judge, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> you, you've got to put some effort into this. You do. You've yeah. got to convince people who do not want to be convinced. But you touched on, you talked about emotion and emotional connection, because I think often too, um, when I talk to some of our clients, you know, whether it's business to business space in particular, or some of those really technical mm. fields, they don't understand often that there's still an emotional component to that engagement with the customer. Yeah. And that's where we like to start and then find the story from there. Well, look, if it all came down to creating the best widget, then it'd be a very different world. It would. We'd it? all be, for example, we'd all be driving Toyotas, <laughs> you know, but, you know, the most profitable company in the world is Porsche. Yeah. You know, um, super expensive, you know, out of the reach of most people. But by Christ, they got a brand yeah. and they've connected it to a very good product. And then you look at, uh, if you still want to stick with automotive, you look at Tesla. Mm. They're the most valuable car company. Yeah. They only make 300,000 vehicles. You know, a smidge compared to Toyota, GM, Ford and so forth. Yeah. And also nowhere near as old. Mm. And if that doesn't tell you that people need to, you know, the, the power of getting people to connect with you on an emotional level and the power of creating a community, yeah. a, almost a movement mm -hmm. around what you do. I mean, you know, it, it's amazing. Like I actually, I'm thinking of a guy now who owns a Tesla and he's totally, and he, he runs a, it's a, it's a software business. And the things, and I've said to him, the things that you love about Tesla, why aren't you trying to, I mean, you, I know you can't get the same depth Mm. as you can with Tesla because of, you know, your product, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But at least make an effort, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, because you're pro you created your product to solve a problem. Exactly. And that problem has meaning to your market. Yeah. Sometimes it's a big problem. Sometimes it's a small problem. It's mm -hmm. still a problem. Yeah. And if you're not describing and connecting and engaging what that problem is and what it means and and that you connect with because we're all human beings mm -hmm. you know and if you're not using that as a leverage you're deliberately disabling your ability to make sales which is critical in, in the current environment yeah. even more it's a deliberate before. act you're yeah. sabotaging yourself yeah. by not doing something yeah do you think that comes into play often too when you encounter business owners or managers who are afraid to ask for the sale and so they don't do the marketing and the sales messaging well um yeah i mean that's a like so in the b2b realm um that is probably like asking for the sale is is a very different thing to when you're constructing the the story i mean I, like I spent a lot of my career in Sweden mm -hmm. and you know I think there's two things that we've got here in, in, in Australia. One is we've got a lot of business owners trying to save their way to success. Very, very risk oh. adverse. Yeah, okay. I've never heard it put that way but that's so true. But that's what they're trying yeah. to do. They're trying to save their way to success. And there's almost this stupid pride in, and I'm sure you've had these conversations where someone will look at you and go, well, I achieved five whatevers and I didn't spend a dollar, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. well, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's look at lost opportunity. How big's your market? Mm. Oh, it's a billion dollars. Yeah. How big are you again? We're six million dollars turnover. Yeah. Hello? Mm. <laughs> and the other thing is, um, there is a, especially in the B2B realm, there is a lack of um, of real high caliber marketing talent. Yeah, that's it's true. Um, it, it, and, and that goes if you trace. I've been an adjunct professor with RMIT University um, in, in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and so if you if you go all the way back through how marketers are educated and trained in this country, um, it's all focused on consumer stuff. Yeah, hardly there's hardly anything for B two B, and then all the uh, a lot of the talent wants to go towards you know selling beer or soft mm -hmm. drink or whatever um you know that's not to say there is no talent in b2b i'm just saying there's a lack of yeah absolutely and i think you know 
that then becomes a challenge because as agencies, we're working with the marketing talent in those businesses. Um, but often, you know, not often, but sometimes they won't tend to take our guidance, even though you and I have been in the B2B market for a very long time. Um, how do you get through to a potential client, let's say, that's, you know, doesn't understand well enough the value that you're going to bring to the table because they've just met you? Um, for me, it's about, well, one, I mean, the, there's a track record that you can show yeah. and everything, but everyone's, of course, interested in, well, what can you do for them? Mm. And I like to create a sense of dissatisfaction in people because I think that's the key to getting people to get over the fear of risk and the fear of change. Oh, okay. So I, I create dissatisfaction in terms of, so I ask, you know, so how big's your market? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, blah, you know. Is it global? Yeah, okay, so it's blah, okay, cool. How big are you? Oh, uh, so you've got some room to grow, okay. So do you want to grow? Do you have the ambition to grow? Because that's the number one thing. Yeah. You know, um, clients, they have to have ambition and money, you know, or else mm -hmm. what's the point? So, um, if, if you've got the ambition to grow, then what has stopped you from growing? Ah, <laughs> now we can have a conversation. Yeah. Um, now, that generally speaking, you know, you, you'll of course have people that they'll lie to you because either, and, and not in a bad way, but because they don't know you well enough yeah. or, but you know, it's kind of like being a doctor and getting them to open up about what their illness is mm -hmm. and getting them to own it and go, you know, so we've had some people where they go, you know what, we really suck at this. We recognize we suck at this and that's why we're talking to you. They're my favorite people. Yes. Yeah. But then you also have this other people where, no, oh, everything's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, why did you want to talk to me in the first place? And, oh no, everything's cool. Yeah. And then you find out, you know, this happened to me the other day actually where um, I was talking to someone, they basically bullshitted me and then I knew from someone who knows that company very well that you know everything is not fine mm. at all. Um, and so I don't know, people are deluded, people have made their own little kingdoms, yeah. people are selfish, people are stupid. Mm. You know, there's a whole range of <laughs> reasons why. Um, and, and we've all met them. <laughs> yes, that's very true. I think um, for me, one of the interesting things in the last couple of years in particular is I've, um, become very straightforward with my clients, like very straightforward. So if I think that what they want to do isn't going to work because I have empirical evidence that that's the case. In the past where I would say, well, if that's really what you want to do, but now I go, if that's really what you want to do, then we're not the right agency for you because in three months time, you're going to be very unhappy. And you'll get the blame. And you're going to upset, you're going to be upset with my brand. Yeah. And that's not, yeah. we're not playing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then they turn around and they actually listen to you because you, you went, well, actually, no. Hmm. Um, whereas if I go back eight years ago when I started social media, I, okay, I'll be like, Oh, okay, I wouldn't recommend that, but you know. If but if you want to put your foot do, in the door, fine, go for yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, I think maybe that's that's the path of travel that every business owner has to go through at some point to back themselves. But yeah, and uh, I mean to be fair to the so to be fair to the client side. If you look at, and especially if you're talking about a business owner, mm. um, you think about all the components that it takes to run a business. So for example, uh, my big weakness is around finance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where I rely upon, you know, people who have expertise in finance. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'd say I'm good at the marketing bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Then if you look at a business owner, you know, typically the, you know, they're an engineer or they're, 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 they've got a professional background somewhere. So they've, they've spent a number of years focused on a very definitive skill. Yeah. And then they've come up with a solution of, oh, I've got a better idea or a better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. And then they, bang, they've got a business. Um, the issue that I think we have as marketers is, if I use my analogy of the finance thing, is that a lot of people seem to believe that they can do marketing. And let's be honest, sometimes people can fluke it. People can, yeah, absolutely. you know, and everyone can come up with a good idea and, and it could actually turn into something that's commercially viable. Um, but 
The difference between marketing and something like legal or, or finance is that everyone listens to their, their, their accountant or everyone listens to their lawyer. You know, mm-hmm. if the lawyer says, do this so you don't get... So, you know, like, okay. Then you do it. Um, but the, the irritating thing with marketing is that everyone thinks that they can do it. And sometimes people get lucky, so that encourages them to keep going. But we come across so many people who have been burned by really bad marketing or bad yeah. people or bad marketing practices. Mm-hmm. And then they go, well, this marketing thing sucks. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it does. But anything sucks if you do it wrong. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, so you, you've got to, it's that sort of paying for the sins of the father mm-hmm. that, that gets really tiresome after a while. And I think I was really happy when I took over the pub because I got to make all the decisions and break every single rule. Yeah. You know, like from a marketing perspective, I put really bad photos up. They were blurry. I posted stuff with like grammatical errors in it. Like I was just me. Um, and stuff went viral, hmm. like left, right and center. You'd be like, it would go in front of 77,000 people. We only had 2000 likes on the page. Yeah. But it's just because I had a story, hmm. I had an emotional connection, and I just talked to the humans. But you got to, because this is what we're going through with Forever is Fallen, mm. is we, this is what I like, is that we are, and it's the same with your, uh, with your pub, you're in the most purest form of judgment. Yes. The market. Yes. The market, right? And what I love about Forever Has Fallen is we are making every single decision. Mm -hmm. Me and my team. Yeah. And unfettered. We haven't got some, we haven't got a committee or we don't have someone going, oh, maybe it should be blue or, you know, or, you know, coming up with brain fart. You're just in it and doing it. We're doing it. Yeah. And we we live and die on our own um, decisions. Decisions. Mm. And the market decides. Yeah. And it's really gratifying to see that, you know what, we are pretty good at this shit. I think so. (laughs) Which is a really nice way to finish. So uh, as we're in this current environment and everyone's kind of being bombarded by all sorts of different things uh, to do with COVID-19 and restrictions for all the business owners that are out there that maybe want to escape reality for a little while, I recommend that you go and find Forever Has Fallen maybe enjoy yourselves for a while and investigate that immersive experience. Even if it just takes you away from the stress for like half an hour. Yeah. It's probably a good thing. Um, Kimon, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time. I love these seats. Thank you for listening to the Seriously Social podcast. See our website for more details at www.socialmediaaok.com.au slash podcast. Check the show notes for credits, music used in the program, and more details about our guests.